you know who I am? Yes. You are the boss. Yeah, the boss. Mo Facts with Adam Curry. August 5th, 2019, episode number two. Hey, Mo. How you doing, Adam? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing real good. Doing real good. So, I think we can call our pilot test episode a success. Since we're yeah, I got- <laughs> we're doing another episode, so <laughs> right, <laughs> something worked. <laughs> yeah, I got no negative feedback. All positive feedback from my end. Um, no thumbs down on the YouTube uh, video. Nice. And I got tons of support from the the uh, NA crowd. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> the no agenda people <laughs> always will come out no matter what's happening. That's always nice. Right. Yeah. I got the same. I, uh, everybody I, I asked to listen, listen. They liked it a lot. They learned. Uh, and they're hungry for more. So I'm glad that um, everybody's been receptive to what we're doing here. And that's the whole point of just learning from both sides of, of different well, both sides of the coin. <laughs> exactly. Both. both sides of the American male coin. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so for after today, I guess we'll ha- we have a website that's uh, that's getting there. I'm having, I'm taking a lot of joy in watching you set that up. Yeah, so um, mofax.com, that's M-O-E-F-A-C-T-Z.com. Um, you can find um, the links to the podcast. You can find also links to my YouTube channel. And there is a direct link for my listeners that I'm bringing aboard to get to the no no agenda uh website as well oh excellent and uh today we'll also have an rss feed set up so you can subscribe to it in your podcast app uh and it will be submitted to apple i have not done a a new podcast submission to apple in a long time so we'll see if it takes more than 24 hours well then i'll have to pull the podfather card (laughs) <laughs> hey help me out here right that's a nice card to have yeah, well yeah that and 50 cents so last time uh we uh man we we talked about a lot but i think we got a basic introduction to some ados uh concepts uh we looked at it uh we looked at some of the uh current democratic uh primary candidates and uh where they stand uh vis-a-vis a black agenda or mm-hmm. um, appeal, maybe I could put it that way. So uh, I think the last thing we discussed that we were going to talk about today was how uh, the Democrat Party in particular is now going after the black vote. I'm really paraphrasing here, so jump in, Mo, if I'm messing it up, uh, by um, targeting black women and, I guess, in the process you know, creating some divide between black women and black men. Right. So what they're trying to do is uh, they're targeting the black women. And I have clips here that state how, um, as, as as I stated in the last show, um, that they think that black women are the backbone. That's a direct quote. Um, and you'll hear in many of my clips of the Democratic Party and the most revi- most reliable voting bloc. So we touched on something last time uh, was the no man at house rule just to show how uh, the Democrats have played this like social engineering game with uh, creating a wedge between the black man and black woman. Now, now this was the uh, no man in the house rule that was part of the 1968 Johnson welfare reform uh, that essentially made it economically more viable for black women and children to not have a man in the house. Right. And the 1968 um, uh, legislation was a, a, an adjustment to the uh, AFDC um, social, was it Social Security Act of 1935 that was established. So it was really originally established in 1935 and it was readjusted where in 1968 you could have a man living in a house as long as it wasn't the child's father. Oh, so that, yeah. So <laughs> uh, I, and, the, and the funny thing was. Um, the no agenda, uh, shop retweeted you guys show from an old, older show that I hadn't heard. Uh huh. Um, and you guys covered some clips that I had covered in one of my videos. Um, my video was titled destruction of the black family on, on my YouTube channel. And you guys use the same exact clips that I use. Oh, okay. Um, so we can really start from there and we can see, um, 
how we both been coming from the same, to me, saying two different angles, addressing the same issue. And then we can see how it's uh, progressed now in, in modern day times and, and, and what they're trying to do in the 2020 election. Okay. Uh, if you want to start with recap, no agenda, no man won. Before we moved into Pruitt Igo, the welfare department came to our home. They talked with my mother about moving into the housing project, but the stipulation was that my father could not be with us. They would put us into the housing project only if he left the state. I got to be honest with you, Mo. I do not remember this clip. Yes. And like I said, the no agenda, um, no agenda shop. Those are the guys that make the great T-shirts for you guys. Uh, yep. uh podcast. And you were asking where the swag was for uh, ADOS. We might have to talk to them. Oh, yeah. They'll <laughs> do it. Oh, yeah. Those guys are great. They'll, they'll make T-shirts and mugs out of anything. <laughs> right. That's, a, that's on another note. But, yeah, they actually – I wasn't aware you guys had covered this. Do you know what episode that was from? How long ago was that? Actually, it didn't say the episode because it, um, it was a clip put on um, SoundCloud. So it hmm. wasn't from a direct direct show. Oh, okay. It was one of your earlier shows because I haven't heard it. So it was pre. Must be. Yeah, must be. 2000, 2016 election. Got That's it. when I started listening to you guys. Got it. Hey, well, I was. Bu- Go ahead. I, I was going to say, when I hear this, is this the origin of the whole concept of baby mama, baby daddy? This is exactly the origin. Mm-hmm. Um, this the notion that black men just go off and leave their children is a mischaracterization. What you had in these times and when this clip was taken and when this lady was speaking from, black men, as we know, couldn't find jobs. Um, You know, they had problems with employment uh, due to racial issues. And they were forced to make a hard decision for whether their children to eat or not. The parents would sit down often and say, you know, it's best for me to leave so you guys can receive uh, aid. And it wasn't an easy decision, you know, but um, what do you do? I mean, we saw this in the Great Depression. I mean, even the same thing with many, many groups of people of different uh, race, racial backgrounds. So it's nothing exclusive to the, um, to black people. But, yeah, that you're right. You're right on when you say um, this is the origin of of the uh, the baby mama syndrome in, in, in black America. And is this. Is the regulation still the case today? Okay, so... Or am I jumping ahead? No, you're not jumping ahead. I can tell you. Okay, now this is where I have my personal experience at. Um, my, my parents went back to college when I was five years old. Um, and I stayed with my grandmother and grandfather. And they were uh, elderly, so they lived in low-income housing. Mm-hmm. And this is we're talking about 1985. And I remember seeing... Men run out of the back door because, you know, um, they were told that the the um, the welfare tenant, check I mean, was coming, not the welfare check, but the welfare people. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, we're coming. Right. And so if you want to get in the clip, too, I think that covers it. Um, recap. No, I know it's in demand, too. The welfare department had a rule that no able bodied man could be in the house if a woman received aid for dependent children. If a man lost his job. He's looking for work. He still had to leave the home. And there was even a night staff of men who worked for the welfare department whose job was to go to the homes of the welfare recipients. And they searched to find if there was a man in the home. Damn. (laughs) Sounds kind of like Nazis, man. Exactly. Damn. Uh, So now you start to see this, how this behavior was starting to form where the state became the 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 husband or the right. man in in the black family and the black man was displaced. Um, now I'm not taking uh, away from responsibility of black men in modern day times that you know um, that do. I mean, there is a, a percentage that don't take care of the responsibility, but it's not the way the media paints it. Uh, but it's, it was just weird that not weird, but it was. Just jarring that you guys cover the same exact clips <laughs> that I had covered in one of my videos. And we were pretty much coming from the same point of these are democratic uh, ideas. Policies, sure. 
policies, yeah. So, um, and when we get into um, the third clip, we'll see what the result and the mental impact was on, on, of having these uh, policies. I remember vividly my mother telling us, if white people come to the house and ask you guys questions, tell them that your father is not here. Tell them that your father has never been here. You have not seen your father. I trusted her. I knew that there was a reason that we had to, to do this charade. And I participated in the charade. I, I sat there and looked those people in the eye and told them with the, with, with, with the, with the uh, pure earnestness that, no, I have not seen my father. And no, my daddy does not live here. And, uh, but I knew that I was lying. And that made me wonder, who are these people and how do they have the power to make my mother lie? We're giving you money. We want to be able to control you. We're giving you money, so we have the right to make stipulations as to how you use it and what you use it for. Yeah, that's pretty cold. Yes. And we're talking like, like I said, this is in the 19, I think this was in the 1950s or maybe 60s. And you fast forward to now, you see how this behavior has, you know, just exploded. And at this time, you know, we're talking uh, in 1980s, like I said this before, they said that 25% uh, of children being born out of uh, into single parent households was an epidemic. Now we're at 75%. So what is it? Um, but I just want to show you how democratic policies and how they've targeted put a wedge between black men and black women. And here we are again in the 2020 election. And it's not even started there. It's really started around 2016 um, as they've seen that black democratic vote, male voter um, rates were down. So now they said we need to target uh, black women to get them saying to counterbalance that loss that they've had for men because Trump has had a effect on the black male patri- patriarchy. Yes, we discussed this last uh, last show where you said that in a in an interesting way, <laughs> Trump gave uh, not just black men but gave American men their their cojones back. Right, and, and th- that's a real effect. And the Democrats know it. So now we see them, um, for lack of a better word, they're they're using their pandering machine that they have, the Democrats have, towards black women. And we can see that in, in the Essence Festival uh, where Kamala Harris was. They also interviewed all the other, other major Democratic um, candidates. One of them being uh, Beto O'Rourke. Mm-hmm. Just just one one question, just to get back to it, Mo. The yes. w- the welfare program that started this no man in the house is that still in effect today or a version of it a derivative? It is a derivative because uh, to receive like programs like Section Eight, you can't right. have a male living in the house. Also, it's income based, so it's really hard to have two, two people right. two incomes to meet under the um the threshold to receive those programs. So it's in a quasi way. Yes, it's still, it's still in place, but we saw it change. Like I said, in 1968, with what you quoted on the last show. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. So I guess now we'll start getting into where we're, where we're at now with this election and how the Democrats are finding out what the, um, what black women want. Uh, uh, the question they ask is what is your message? What message do you want to send to black voters? And first, they asked Beta Rourke. What message do you want to send to black women voters? I want black women in this country to know that they matter. They matter in so many ways, including the fact that they have produced every single major victory for almost every single Democratic election in the history of this country. And so- oh, is that true? No, they, in no other way that black men have it. I, I mean, because we because we voted in a block. Yeah, but it's it. But like I said, this is the pander machine separation is, right there. Yeah, right. Um. So then they asked Bill De Blasio. First of all, I want to say, as a Democrat, 
all black women should be praised and appreciated for being the backbone of this party, for being the difference makers. Wow. And this is the year where I think that's going to come into full focus. Democrats need to not pay lip service and not be occasional, occasionally respectful of black women, but every single day. Because we're going to win this election. It's going to take extraordinary uh, energy. It's going to take extraordinary turnout. It's going to take the organizational passion and power of black women all over this country to make it happen. So- you know, when I hear this kind of stuff, you know, these talking points, and you know, I think I'm very attuned to it. It's a lot of what we do with No Agenda, and uh, you know, you get these compilations where either the media is saying the same thing over and over again, or the talking points with, of the um, of the candidates. You can start to pick it up. You can you can feel the similarities. You know, it's a talking point. But I wonder where who created this. I mean, are these the strategists, the think tanks? Is there one person we know of who's the mastermind behind this idea? You're, you're getting ahead, but yes. We're, we're, we're <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll take it at, at your own pace, sir. At your no, own no, pace. But, but, but no, you're right. There, it, Whenever you hear certain memes, and that's what, one, of you, one of the great things about your show uh, that you have with uh, John, is that you point out these memes, uh, and you pluck them out, and often you put them in a compilation or saying it back to back to back to back, where you can just see that it's it's a talking point. Yeah. And yes, they have think tanks, they have uh, strategists, they have uh, polls down to the county, down to the the block, the city block yeah. that they tailor these things to. Uh, but let's see what uh, Pete Buttigieg had to say. What message do you want to send to black women voters? The biggest thing that I think is important for black women voters to hear right now is how powerful you are. Uh, Election outcomes have changed, and they've changed for the better, because black women have stood up and demanded answers on not just issues like racial inequality in the workplace or gender inequality in healthcare or vice versa, uh, but also the expectation for economic empowerment to be felt by all. All right, Mayor Pete. Right, so Pete, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're all on message. Yep. Um, now, before I play this next clip, I want you to pay close attention and see what Cory Booker said that the other three didn't say. Okay, we're listening for the for the discrepancy. Spot the differences in the picture. Black voters right. need to understand their power, and they are going to significantly determine mm-hmm. who the nominee of this party is going to be. And it's not enough to determine the nominee. We need to determine the agenda of the party. Well, he said a whole, uh, two different things there. I, I said I, I kind of stepped on it. So if you want to, it's yeah, a short clip. Of so you course. Can play it again. Of course. Of course. Of course. Black voters need to understand their power, and they are going to significantly determine who the nominee of this party is going to be. And it's not enough to determine the nominee. We need to determine the agenda of the party. Okay, he said black voters have to recognize their power, I think. You you caught it at the beginning, black voters. Yeah. Not not black women. Black voters, yeah. He, he's messing up. Uh oh, off message. <laughs> got to pull, got to pull Corey out. Got to give him a talking to. <laughs> right, and Corey, and he, you got to slow it down, Corey, with that whole agenda thing too. Now, yeah, you're really, <laughs> don't do that. That's not <laughs> yeah, how it you, works. <laughs> no, you turn out, you activate. You don't ask. You don't ask for things. So Corey is way off message. I don't know if uh, uh, if uh, he got the message or got the uh, you know the memo. But no, no black voter talk. It's black women. Got it. Uh, and I'm not saying this. Um, let me let me clarify what I'm saying here. You have a handful of black elites, i.e., the boule, b o u l e, boule, b o b o u l e, um, that are trying to drive. That's their job is to steer the the the, the black majority in the direction that the elite want them to go. Now, when, so, when we say boule, now you and I have talked about this uh, off air. This really the um, well, I I equate it to almost Illuminati, <laughs> except you can you can point to them. So whereas maybe George Soros would be an elite, uh, mm-hmm. who is the who are the elites in the boule? Just well, you in, have o- you have Oprah, you have Obama, you have. Um, uh, let's see, Al Sharpton, you have yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the talking heads on television. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of them come from the Divine Nine uh, Greek fraternities. Oh, um, yes. So, 
Yeah, so I mean, it's the it's the intellectual class uh, of Black society, the ones that go and not 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 bl- blanketing all, but they usually come out of the um, Ivy League or you know uh, or these higher level um, universities, and they go through the you know the 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 indoctrination of when their whole job is not and as like, like I said before. Cory Booker was wrong to say what is the agenda. No, you can't know. It's not about what they want. So, so this means Corey's not really in the boule. I, I would think he is. I just think he nobody got him the. <laughs> just, you know, he didn't show up and, for orientation day. Right. I don't think he. And, but I think Corey may. He understands that Kamala has the machine behind her. I mean, because they're the two black candidates, right? Yeah. So he he he's a smart guy. I'm not going to you saying denigrate him anyway. So he understands what's going on here. We've seen how the machine. I think you guys even covered it on your show how the machine is uh, covering for and protecting Kamala. Sure. And and just like any group of elites, they want to protect their own stuff. So that's that's what their agenda would be is protecting themselves first and foremost. Right. So I think what Corey did, and this is pure speculation. He's saying what is, you know, what is the masses saying? Uh, he can't say ADOS. He can't say, you know, uh, tangibles. He can't say these things. So, but one of the memes in, on, on the ADOS side is having an agenda. So I think that was kind of like a, a dog whistle to, you know, kind of pull some of the, you know, uh, ADOS crowd to him by mm-hmm. saying, uh, talking about agenda, because that's way off message. Yeah, yes, for sure. Okay, so you asked a question. You said, um, are there think tanks? Are they um, that, you know, you come are up shaping, with this. Yeah. Right, uh, are shaping these ideas? I have a question for you. Okay. What do you know about the Brookings Institute or the Brookings Institute institution? Yeah, very little. Um, I, I think... Although we, you know, I try, I tend to avoid messages coming out of think tanks, and I'm always looking for, you know, who's a member of what. Uh, uh, but I think we'd probably be surprised to hear who's in it and what their message is, and I'm, I'm, ears open. Okay, so the Brookings Institute on uh, September tenth, two thousand eighteen, uh, they had a seminar slash. Uh, panel of black female elected leaders um, called Claiming uh, Seats at the Table. And this was vo- um, focused on uh, black females um, ta- getting, um, what, let, me, let me read exactly what it says so I don't mess it up. Uh, so exploring the tapped and untapped electoral strength of black women. Oh, okay. So, There's your agenda. Uh, right. Claiming Seats at the Table one. And, it, and before you play that, just listen to the pandering. Um, I'm going to start by just talk, giving you a little perspective of my, my household in the 70s. If you were like me growing up in the 70s, the, the portraits of MLK, JFK, and Jesus hung on, on a lot of folks' walls. That was the, the trinity. Today, the trinity of Oprah, Beyonce, and Michelle Obama could almost replace them. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this guy? That's funny. This is, uh, this is Andre M. Perry. <laughs> He's a David M. Uh, Rubenstein fellow with mm. the Brookings Institute. Mm, all right. And what he says was, and this is true in, in, a, in a lot of black households, you had MLK. Uh, not not my generation, maybe the generation he comes from. I think he's uh, maybe a generation before me. Uh, you had MLK, JFK, and Jesus, you know, um, um, hanging on the wall. Yeah. And he said, I mean, this is his words. Oprah, Beyonce, and Michelle could replace MLK, JFK, and Jesus. <laughs> wow. So I think that answers who's the boule. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, who, who are, these are definitely <laughs> car carrying members of the boule. Mm-hmm. But the pandering, I mean, I, I don't hate to keep using that word, but that is so disingenuous to say that I would... It kind of makes you eye roll, but it's—I presume it's not true. Oh, 
You telling me I, that people have pictures of Beyonce, Michelle Obama, and uh, what was the first one? Oprah, um, uh, Oprah, Oprah um, Emma K, JFK, and Jesus. Right, but not. But that you you think you're saying they've been replaced by the new pictures? I wouldn't say the pictures set per se on their wall, but in the, their mind, right in their mind, correct. Got it. Got it. Because Beyonce has been worshipped yes. in church services. <laughs> I mean, let, uh, this is a real occurrence. Um, Michelle was the only thing really holding Barack in the White House. Um. As far as uh, the the mass of black female voters, mm-hmm. they were voting for her, her more than him. And Oprah, man, she she's a force. You know, what I'm saying, I mean, as you know, she's a media force all to, all into herself. Of course. So so in 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 the mind, yes. And, and I don't know what that says, but <laughs> but yes, I think that's a real occurrence. So what we're going. Uh, by next, the way, that, is, that that may also be the case for many white women. I, I, yes, yeah, I, I, yeah. Uh, especially with Beyonce, yep. Beyonce holds a lot of, a lot of clout. Hell yeah! Well, she's the queen, it, queen bee. Right. Yeah. Especially to hold a church service, and uh, I mean, well, uh, later on in this, in this podcast, you know, as we get down the the road, we'll start to look at you know these. I mean, uh, just these weird. Occurrences that we're seeing and, and all on, from the left. Well, it's, uh, it's, so, it's creating uh, worship and creating profits around entertainment people, which is always interesting. Right, and then those those uh, entertainers carry messages. So what they do is they take the entertainers, um, and we've seen this before. Uh, you, uh, Margaret Sanger, yes. and I don't have the quote right in front of me, but she said, "If you want to reach black people." You need to get black ministers. The ministers, that's right. That's why we have all the reverends everywhere. Right. That's why you have every um, Reverend Justin Jackson, Reverend uh, Al Sharpton. You know, all, you always have to have the reverend. So now, in the new, in this new generation, the entertainer has replaced the, the reverend. reverend. Ah, got it. So, um, so next we have Aaron Haynes Wack, uh, and she's from the National Race, um, National Race and. Uh, ethnicity writer for the Associated Press. And that's claiming the seats part two. Ladies, I'm going to open up this conversation. Uh, It was probably about nine months ago that the country learned what the rest of us have long known, right? What we have been living, uh, frankly, and that is that, you know, black women are really the center, uh, the backbone of of democratic politics and the party's most loyal and and really consistent voting bloc, right? But that wasn't just true last December. Uh, you know, black women were, frankly, part of, you know, what we like to call the resistance, uh, you know, in 2016, uh, showing up at the polls to overwhelmingly, uh, you know, vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, black women were there in 2008 and 2012 when over 90 percent of us, you know, voted for Barack Obama. Uh, you know, voting really for us has been a form of resistance, you know, for a really long time. Uh, and I think that that's something that, that the rest of the country has, has woken up to and, and the moment that we now find ourselves in. Huh. Resistance or compliance? It's a thin line. Right. And as you heard her say, black women are really the center. The backbone. The backbone. The backbone. Yeah. Right. This is this. <laughs> what we've heard two, three people say this. Well, but I, I will say by chance, uh, Tina and I were watching uh, Eddie Murphy Delirious last night because for some mm-hmm. reason uh, Netflix is promoting it. And. He does this whole skit about his mom and throwing the shoe, and it's it's kind of a, a thread throughout the whole thing. This is the one where he has the red leather outfit on, right? And it's famous, um, and he talks about the you know really mother is in control of everything. So that perception, I'd say, in my mind, uh, I don't know if, if the mom is the background, but the female figure in black household has a very strong presence in my mind. It, it is safe to say that Black America, for the most part, is a matriarchy. Yeah, uh, they are, are where. But we know where it's coming from now. We we right. we now understand why because Black women had to run the family. Exactly, exactly, Got and it. they and now white women see them as you guys have been doing this all along. White feminists, uh, white liberal women. How did you do it? 
you know, and and that's why they hold Beyonce in such high regard, and Oprah in such high regard, and Michelle Obama in such high regard, uh, and and other people of that status, because they say you guys have been doing it all along. You know, um, let's use your blueprint. So um, on this panel was the Baltimore um, Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh. Uh, and this is before she had her uh, issues. Oh, yeah, where she got uh, kicked out for uh, selling her book and never delivering and just taking the money. Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, claiming seats three. But being able to raise money is important for all of us. And sometimes we can be swooped up by the energy and it doesn't cost as much in certain races as it may cost for others. And I always tell people, be prepared to raise money. You start with your family and your friends. You know, people can't just tell you to run for office, write a check. You know, so developing that capacity to raise money is important, whether you are publicly funded or whatever. You've got to be able to cover those polls on election day. Elections are won and lost on election day because people haven't covered their polls. All right. The message is clear there. Yeah. Raise money. Raise money. And, And she said developing the capacity to raise money is important, whether you are publicly funded or whatever what is that or whatever and that's when we look at her situation uh, for the people that don't know uh she's the baltimore mayor and she's uh, she was under investigation for uh self-dealing in the connection with uh thousands of books being sold and she ended up receiving roughly about eight hundred thousand dollars from the university of maryland medical system yeah, this is Where, this is a, not a new trick, by the way. This is a a very common way of getting paid, taking bribes, by writing a book, and then you know you always want uh, a big company to come in and order a whole bunch of your books, mm-hmm. uh, and the publishers love that too for obvious reasons. And so they, you know, whoever was in on this with her, I, I don't remember, you know, said ordered a whole bunch of books, and they paid her the money, and then she didn't even have to print them because they didn't care. Right, and um. Uh, that, that was the University um, Ma- University of Maryland Medical si- um, System, and they paid her roughly over five hundred thousand dollars for the copy of books, and she ended up resigning. So this, um, so when she said that, whatever, that, that lit that's the fuse for me. <laughs> that that's the uh, yeah. So whatever, you know, go ahead and be corrupt. Whatever, you got to get it right. So that's when I started digging. And I was I went back to the beginning. Ah, the night, uh, this the is special why I election. love you, Mo. This is a, this is Mo facts digging in deep. Right. The, I, so I went back to the special election of uh, 2016 in Alabama, mm-hmm. and I I found two articles um, written by the uh, center. Um, let me see. Let me pull it up. Now, this was the Andrew Gillum Doug Jones special election. No, that was the Doug Jones versus uh, the uh, guy. Uh, uh, yeah, I know he mean. Uh, you, you, you know the 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 guy that they um was the worst candidate ever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'll look it up. Yes, um, Roy Moore. Roy yeah, Roy Moore. Moore. There you go. Okay, uh, the, the the two articles written by the Center for Public Integrity, and those two articles were entitled um, "Super PACs Had Raised Millions to Mobilize Black Voters." Does it matter that it's funded? That its funders are white. That's one article. Mm-hmm. And the second article was dark money boosts Democratic super PACs that um, that battle corrupt campaign finance system. So I was reading through this article and it's, it talks about um, the black pack. And the black pack is ran by Miss uh, Adrian Schrofier. Shro- uh, so just a little background on her. You want to play a uh, black pack, Adrian Sh- Shrofier. People are uh, concerned Shrof- about the economy. They're concerned about jobs. We need to raise wages. Mm-hmm. They're concerned about health care. They're concerned about criminal justice reform. We actually can have an impact, um, on all of those issues and help to redirect, uh, our country right now. Cause our country is in a crisis. Uh, really and black is. folks more than many understand what that is. Mm-hmm. They know what it looks like and are prepared to do their part to make sure that we get back on the right track. All right, so in that election, uh, the Black Pack spent almost six uh, six hundred fourteen thousand uh, dollars canvassing in the last, you know, saying few weeks, mm-hmm. and that goes back to what the mayor said of Baltimore. 
you got to get the voters out on election day. Yep. Uh, so uh, they knocked on, let's see, they knocked on more than 500, um, 520,000 doors. They sent more than 270,000 um, uh, sent mail to over 271,000 uh, homes. And they made more than 72,000 phone calls. All that costs money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that race, 19 million and nine candidate on uh, spending overall was spent on spent on that race. Uh, so so I start digging into the money. So I went and looked at the Black Pack. The Black Pack in 2018 received four hundred thousand dollars from Mr. George Soros. Oh, of course, <laughs> got to see George show up somewhere. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So Adam, I ask you, ask you who who is George Soros? You know, saying for the, for the listeners. Well, George Soros is a very famous uh, hedge hedge fund guy. He uh, he became very famous for shorting the pound, which means he was betting on the pound going down. And he might have even had some some foreknowledge of some gold trades that were going on. And uh, anyway, he really scored incredibly big on that in the billions of dollars. And as an elite. He is uh, always looking out for his own interests, and he's very active with his Open Society Institute and the hundreds, if maybe even thousands, of small nonprofits that he uh, finances. Uh, I think it's well established that he at least had some hand in financing Black Lives Matter, and uh, all of this is intended to, and this is his track record, his history, is to cause political uh strife tension or maybe direction in order to protect his own stuff right so not only did they receive um money from you know directly from george soros they received money from the pro hillary clinton super PAC, uh pack priorities usa action Hmm. which mr george soros donated four million dollars to that pack in 2018 so he, you know what I'm saying, he is, is more than likely he's funneling money through one pack to another pack. Um, so it doesn't seem like he's completely steering it. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's what he's well known for is spreading his money out. And I think didn't he say he was going to put a billion dollars out, and he spread that out amongst all these small little groups. Right, and we've seen him. Me and you talk behind the scenes about what I've termed the Soros sisters. Yeah, my favorite and term. <laughs> what that is is, um. A lot of DAs, including Kamala Harris, so dis- um, district attorneys, district attorneys, he's funded m- m- um, many, many of these races. Um, that's going to be another topic for another show. But I just have a list, a laundry list of uh, DA races that he's funded. Um, if we want to go to Black Pack, um, uh, Adrian uh, Shroshire, that's I mean, that's her name. Uh And it talks about how they fund uh, Andrew Gillum uh, after the the Jones race. 90 to 95 to 98 percent of the African-American vote um, and and, and the substantial part of the young vote. That's the formula for Democrats in the South. It is. And the Democratic Party needs to concentrate on promoting and listening to black people because obviously we're with them. And in alarm in huge numbers, but they need to start listening to us, listening to our concerns, and putting people in leadership positions who can make decisions. Yeah. When when Jones he got what forty percent of the white vote of the white women vote, which means sixty percent voted against him. Yeah. That's a big number, and the Democratic Party needs to know where their bread and butter is buttered yep. and where it's made, and listen to us. Very quickly, Adrian, you guys are going to keep going. You're in other states besides Alabama. Yeah, we will be. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity in the South. Um, we know. That that Stacey Abrams is running uh, in Georgia. We yep. know that um, Andrew Gillum is running uh, in Florida. Yep. Um, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there, but also in the Midwest. So we'll yeah. make some decisions about where we're going to We're be. just going to talk about those very two races in our next block. Eric Guster, Adrian Shropshire, Bernard Similton. Yeah, this is uh, from uh, the Boulay show, known as Joy Reid. Right. And they're spreading the money around. Of course. I, I, but the thing is, when you listen to the Baltimore mayor go back, she makes it seem like people are just breaking out their checkbooks and busting up their uh, busting open their uh, piggy banks. their uh, piggy banks to donate to these you know to these packs, and that's not the case. You have very um, very rich non-black donors, and what are their motives? So 
one question I had, and I want to get answered, is what is dark money? What is dark money? Okay, we're going to find out. This year, approximately $11 billion will be spent on political ads. But who pays to interrupt your TV shows? Sometimes we're in the dark. Citizens United allows corporations and unions to donate freely to campaigns. But PACs and super PACs have to disclose their donors. And politically active nonprofits don't. It's called dark money. Since 2010, dark money groups have spent over $600 million in election ads. 73 million dark dollars have already been spent in 2016. Critics argue that voters have a right to know who's behind political ads and which special interest groups support which candidates. Yeah, I think this is the difference when you see a political ad. Um, the non-dark money will usually have a, uh, you know, a statement. I'm Adam Curry. I approve this message. And, mm-hmm. and the dark money will say paid for by you know, citizens for Curry. Right. And the question is, when people invest, I mean, we, we all know this. When people invest in a campaign, they expect a return on their investment. And if you have uh, non-black, and I mean, that's what this uh, article says. We have non-black funders funding black PACs. Now we see why it's not a black agenda pushed. No, of course not. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> you always got to follow the money, right? So it's just it, this is why you don't hear ADOS. You were asking before in the last show, why don't you hear ADOS? Why don't you hear? They are in a weird way. Democrats always scream up and down and jump up and down about voter suppression. But this is a form of voter suppression. It's a direct form, a legal form, and quite cynical, actually. Right. Um, you've only, you know, you only heard uh, reparations talk, seriously talked about by one candidate, and that's the one candidate we talk about, Marianne Williamson. Um, so now we have to understand um, where the campaign spending goes where the money goes to the campaign spending. The average American family would have to work more than 14,000 years. The highest paid guy in the NBA, Kobe Bryant, would have to play for 29 years to make as much money as Barack Obama spent to become president in 2008. Yes, we can. $730 million. This year, the winner, whether it is him again or someone else, is widely expected to spend as much or maybe more for the privilege of getting that ultimate corner office, the one with no corners. So where does all that money go? For Mr. Obama, 56% of it went to media, according to an analysis by the Center for Responsive Politics. Television, radio, and internet ads. $427 million worth. That means even at $3 million for 30 seconds, he could have bought every commercial in the last Super Bowl and half of this year's game, too. Yeah, now you're uh, you're on my turf here, of course, because... This is something that I know and uh, the No Agenda show has talked about for years. And that's that, you know, even even the vetting of candidates, you you can see it. You can see how they position the top candidates in this uh, um, in this preliminary. And, you know, it's it's who has the most money. That's one of the main requirements. How much money you got? Because it's going to be ours. We're taking it. And this is and I'll just take a, a page from uh, Dvorak's book. This is why California doesn't matter to Republicans because and, and why they don't spend money there, which has actually pissed off all of the media properties located in California because they can't get any money. It's a bonanza. It's, it's tens of billions of dollars on each cycle. And California media is not getting it because, you know, the Democrats don't they know it's their state. They don't have to pay anything. Uh, Republicans know that there, there's no no chance uh, in the foreseeable future to win anything so they ignore it and that's a big problem but yes it's it's all going into media or the majority goes into media so from that thinking and and you guys opened my eyes up to that to that you know, realization that the tv uh, networks want a competitive race it's similar to in sports you don't want a golden state that just blows out everybody. You want a competitive league. 
So is that why maybe they're propping up Kamala Harris? Because Joe Biden is kind of running away with the um, Democratic uh, primary. It can it be that if you don't if you don't have the the you know what I'm saying the competitive race there that the money won't come flowing in? Yeah, you got to you got to have a competition. If I totally agree. If you've got one clear winner already, and 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 this has always been our theory behind the polls. Polling is always, oh, neck and neck, real close. Oh, you don't know. Which to me is always a call to the to the money. It's like, no, you better better up your spend on your candidate. And you know what? After the first debate, the polls even tricked me. Because okay. just listening to, I mean, I was at work, you know, I mean, they have CNN on. And it's like, oh, after the first debate, Kamala Harris gets a boost. <laughs> yeah. But then she didn't show any money and she went down again. It's crazy. Right. So I was like, whoa. It was saying, but then when I went and looked at the numbers, it was a small uptick. Yeah. But like, as you as you pointed out, she gets a boost is to, you know, make the uh, Biden supporters. Hey, we need to, you know, chip in. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's our favorite, our favorite term. Chip in. Yes. Right. So. I just want people to understand this one thing. I, and I, I want this to be a running theme in this show. A term called nudging. Ah, yes. I've heard you talk about this. And nudging is when they take one idea and they kind of, it's like, um, it's kind of what, what the whipsaw is for the No Agenda listeners. Um, subliminal, where they just p- kind of subtly plant this idea in your head. Uh, and the best case I've seen with nudging is for the ring, uh, the ring doorbell. The oh, yes, specific. yes, yes, yes. The, the the spy camera. Right. You didn't see commercials really for the ring doorbell. What you saw was news stories mm-hmm. of guys crapping on people's lawns, <laughs> stealing boxes, yeah. you know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's what you guys call a native ad. Yes. Um. So with the, with how they got me, I was nudged. Kamala gets a boost. And I was like, oh, no, not Kamala. I mean, because... I think she's a terrible person, but that's just my personal opinion. So I, I mean, I perked up and looked, and I said, "Let me go check the numbers," and it was nothing. Right. So it, it we are we're all susceptible to this. So I want people to, you know, be aware of the nudge, and they even created a whole uh, governmental department for for nudging. <laughs> uh, under Obama, uh, were you were you aware of that? No, was it the Department of Nudging? Uh, how, <laughs> let, let, hold on let me pull it uh let me let me uh i did not know this quick. but you know this is this is pr this is uh this is what big companies are paid a lot of money to do is to nudge them i think there's a book too that may be called nudging i have to look that up you want to keep talking while i look this up I mean, just to I mean, maybe go into more of uh just how campaigns work well, I mean, what I think is interesting is that we have actually witnessed, you know, history with uh, Donald Trump, where all the nudging and all the, I mean, it, it, the guy appeared to be bulletproof. It didn't matter what they said in the polls up until election day, up until the evening of the results, the polls were still, I think, in the high 90% for Hillary. It, uh, which at that point, I don't know if you're nudging anymore. You're just desperately holding on to a life raft just to, you know, in complete denial, maybe. But it shows to, to me, and this was even the 538 guys, you know, Nate Silver, oh, the smartest guys in the room. They know everything. And they all fell flat because they were really all part of a nudging program, whether they knew it or not, whether they were an active participant or a passive participant. And in this case, it just didn't work. And I think there's a lot of complacency uh, and a lot of um, reliance on data from people who also make mistakes, you know, like climate scientists. You know, people make all kinds of mistakes. So that okay, that, so, that nudging uh, uh, <laughs> was was more shoving and it just didn't work last time around. But in general, it's how uh, media determines what we drive what we drink what we eat what we listen to who we love you know all of that stuff 
So, uh, under the executive order, uh, under Obama, it was executive order 13707. The social and behavioral science team was created. Ah, yes, I do remember this. I do right. remember this. Yes. And, and it, 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 the team is no longer active you know saying, as of January 21st, 2017. So it was shut down. But Miss Maya uh, Shankor, uh, she is the one uh, that headed the team. And now I think she, I believe she works for Google now. Oh, <laughs> the, nudge, so, the nudge machine. Right. So what, what we're seeing is this idea. And the best way I can explain what a nudge is, is from the movie Inception. Mm-hmm. How they say that they could plant an idea in your head without you even realizing it. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I want people... This is one of my passions is pe- for people to identify the nudge and like, you know, uh, block it. So polling is one way, polling numbers right. and, and uh, polling results. What other uh, specific nudges are we looking for now? I-, I think that what you guys cover is native ads, um, memes. Uh, it's just a ho- it's, uh, hashtags is another one. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw on um, uh, on Twitter today before I got on, which I, I don't normally, I'm not normally on Twitter. And I just started, and the funny thing is I never got on social media prior to doing this. Uh, <laughs> Welcome, I, Welcome I to the pit. <laughs> well, I, I understood what it was. I mean, I had a Twitter account because I would just, it was the best way of keeping track of real time news. Right. But one of the things that was uh, was trending was, uh, let me see if it's still trending. It was the, and you guys covered well, it. Well, trending by itself uh, on social media is a nudge mechanism. Right. And the one that's trending now on the top is the Charlottesville's lie. Right. And you guys have covered this incessantly. So I know what it says. We're saying what was said, and I don't really, really want to get into the details of it, but that's an example. Yeah. Um, where you can take something that is true or untrue, that is untrue, and make it seem true, or take something that's true and make it seem untrue. Right. That's the find people on both sides comment. Right. Uh, and I'm reading these tweets and I'm just like, geez, like, that's some powerful stuff, man. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> well, it is. It's very powerful. And uh, what I found. Uh, cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on social media, but really it's like an inbox for me. And so any, mm-hmm. anything that's directed at me is what I look at. And then, you know, maybe I'll, I'll look at the feed for a second or two. And it's just, cause it's all just kind of nonsense, but someone had replied to me about, I think it was about Kamala Harris or something that, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but what I realized very quickly is it was actually a bot. Oh yeah. It was about Tulsi Gabbard and you know, just Tulsi Gabbard really took some good swipes and dented the armor of Kamala Harris. And I think it was unexpected, but she had it all going on. She had the white outfit. I mean, she was the white hat. It was, it was perfectly orchestrated. Whoever did that. Um, and so the meme had to come out that she's really, uh, a Putin shill because she's an apologist for Assad and Russian bots are the ones creating all this excitement about her. And I realized it was an actual fucking bot that was tweeting that to me. I mean, that's how crazy it's gotten. Bots tweeting about fake bots. Right. And and another nudge, I mean, we talked about it on the last show, was that reparations is an assistance. Uh, assistance program. Yes, exactly. Right. And that's um, Don That's Don Lemon. Exactly. If, 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 uh, Who I think is Marianne, it's ADOS as far as I know. I, I believe so. Uh, allegedly. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you gotta say alleged now. You, you always gotta say. <laughs> Boy, I don't want to get sued. <laughs> <laughs> but that goes to show you, if she didn't push back against that, that would become an issue. Yeah, yeah that would become a, uh, a nudge. that would uh, that would um, what's the word? Galvanize or Propagate. solidify? Right, you know, what I'm saying that term uh, reparations with uh, equal assistance, assistance right? That's very that interesting. Great. Now, do you think Don did that on purpose, or does he is he ignorant? Who writes Don's questions is a question. He didn't write that question. I wouldn't think so. No. 
So who writes it? But he read it. But, but I mean, he might be like a- Anchorman. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> it, you know, I, the only example I had is non-political. I did, I did one acting gig. And I did an episode of Swamp Thing. <laughs> and this is like 1991. And I loved it because it was shot on film. It was really professional. And I was like some asshole rock star. And in the script at a certain point, I was supposed to be talking to my manager and I'm drunk. And the, the line read, I don't know, man. I was really blotto. And I read like, there's no heavy metal rock star who uses the term blotto in 1991, F- forget it. That's written in the script. That's what you're reading. Right, right, and and that's what we realize these uh, these anchor people are. They're talking heads. Yeah. Whatever it says, teleprompter on the, readers. Uh, yeah. Whatever the teleprompter says. I mean, they're not journalists. Let's, yeah. let's be honest. <laughs> the news they're models not out here breaking news. And... No, they're new- news models is what they are. <laughs> right. So my question would be, who wrote the question for Don Lemon? And what was it intentional? I believe so. I I think it was um this, this is just being me. I'm gonna put my uh, 10 four hat on. They understood Mary Ann Williamson, and like I said, I have my I mean, I have uh my reservations about her. One is because she puts a number on it that I don't agree with the number. Two is you're saying some of the other stuff she's into, but that's not here nor there. She what she's doing is putting a message out there that no other black candidate, major candidate for president has ever put out there. And I have to respect her for that. And I got the utmost respect for her. And I think that was a, a form of sabotage. I honestly believe because yeah, she would have walked into you. that trap. Yeah. 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 Then it, it would have been that she would have been stuck with it. Right. Oh, Marianne says reparations assistant, you know? Yeah. So I, I think maybe uh, that was a sabotage. And two, and she even said it, and I have a clip here. It's a lot, I'm kind of long clip. I don't know how we're doing on time. Yeah, we got time. We're good. We can listen to this clip, and this was post the debate, where she goes and she um she even calls out um Don Lemon for saying, How dare you ask me? How can I come up with a number? If you want to go into that clip, it's kind of long. You can stop it when you want to, but I thought it was very interesting. The reason I support reparations is because reparations carry moral force. <laughs> You know, Catholics go to confession and Jews on the day of Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, is the day of atonement. That is a spiritual principle. Until you clean something up, it will continue to cause effects. So you have to deal with things on the level of cause. The United States has an original character defect, and that is racism. Now, I think the average American has not been properly educated about the real history of race in the United States because we are decent people, we are a good people, and we have a sense of justice. However, too many of us aren't really clear about exactly, exactly what went down here. In 1619, the first slaves were brought to the United States and the slaves were not freed until 1865. Two and a half centuries of slavery. Now, at the end of slavery, General Tecumseh Sherman said that all Former slaves would receive 40 acres and a mule. So this is important. Reparations were promised at the time. What happened, unfortunately, in most of the cases, those 40 acres and a mule were not given. It was understood that people who obviously had not been part of the economy, they had been enslaved persons, were now freed. But as Martin Luther King would say 100 years later, freed to what? We know what they were freed from, but what were they freed to? As soon as the federal troops left in 1877, white legislatures throughout the South passed what were called the Black Code Laws. Now, the Black Code Laws were vicious. They were passed to ensure subpar economic, social, and political opportunities for black people. Now, with that, you've got another 100 years of what today we would call domestic terrorism. What do you call lynchings, if not domestic terror? What do you call the Ku Klux Klan, if not domestic terrorists? What do you call institutionalized white supremacy and segregation, if not domestic terror? So we're talking about two and a half centuries of slavery, followed by another hundred years of institutionalized violence against black people in America. 
So the issue of reparations, first of all, let's look at this in some historical context. In 1988, Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, where we gave between 20 and $22,000 to every surviving prisoner from the Japanese internment camps. And since 1945, at the end of World War II, Germany has paid $89 billion in reparations to Jewish organizations. Now, that doesn't mean the Holocaust didn't happen, but it has gone far towards establishing reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Germany and the rest of Europe. That is why I want reparations for slavery. There is an inherent acknowledgement of harm that was done, a debt that was owed, and a willingness to pay it. Yes, things have gotten better in many, many ways. And the whole issue of reparations is simply that we have not finished. We have not yet completed the job of full reconciliation. And I'm not saying reparations are going to fix everything, because we also know how much inner work has to be done, issues of privilege, etc. But it will go a far way. My plan is to appoint a reparations council. And this reparations council would be made up of black leaders representing American descendants of slaves. And there are many, such as Professor Sandy Darity at Duke University, people who have been doing scholarly work for years on this subject. My proposal is that there be between 200 and $500 billion that would be paid by the U.S. government over a period of 20 years, dispersed to this council for them to disperse according to their decisions as long as the stipulation is that these, this money is to be spent on projects of educational and economic renewal. Yeah. And I have been in this conversation long enough to know that whatever number you say, there are going to be some who say it's too much, and there are going to be some who say it's not enough. Because if you actually do the math from 40 acres and a mule in 1865, and you equate that to today, that would be trillions of dollars. That's not politically feasible, but I think 200 to 500 billion dollars is. We have younger generations who understand the very concept of historical trauma, so that we understand that these are psychological and emotional wounds, as well as economic wounds, and with the paying of reparations, we can go far in our time to make a difference. All right. I, uh, I let that play all the way through. That was really interesting. Um... Now, there's one thing in there that doesn't probably doesn't compute with you, and that's how it can be spent. She had some stipulations on that. Yeah, two things, like I said, ninety percent of what she said, I totally agree with. I mean, she completely. But one is how it's going to be spent. When she says programs, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's <laughs> whoops. Then we're getting off track there with her, right? Even you caught that. I mean, not so you couldn't, but I mean, like that was. I mean, cause the reason why I say even you, people like me are more sensitive, and we're listening for the BS. Yeah, yeah of course, of we're, course. We're waiting. We're waiting. I mean, because we've been BS for so long. It's like, you know, uh, it's like you're talking to a used car salesman when you talk to politicians. Right. You know, you're waiting for that. You know, what? what's, what's, where's the what's other the hook going to drop? What's the hook? What's right, the what's catch? The hook? Yep, yep. And when she said two things, and she has to stop saying this. One, well, when you do the math, 40 acres in a mule adds up to trillions of dollars. But, but, then, but, <laughs> but it's going to be and, 200 to 500 billion. And my, as my dad said, Whenever you say but, <laughs> that just oh, yeah, negates what it, <laughs> Yeah, what came before it. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. So um, you can't say, yeah, we owe you two. And I say trillion, so just say two. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the lowest for, uh, number you can say if you use it in plural. Um, you say two trillion, but we want to give you 200 billion. That, that math just doesn't fly with me. Right. Uh, and then two, and then you're going to put it in programs. Yeah, you know what Wait that means. It's going to get stolen. It's not going to do any good. All right, so it's something that you and John talk about because something she said, she said it's not politically feasible. Feasible, yes, yes. It's it's something you and John talk about, about this new um, uh, monetary idea of ah, printing money. Modern monetary theory, yes. Can you, can, you, can you dive into that or, you know what I'm saying? Oh, or, I can try. Uh, and I got this, well, it's... It's actually a uh, it's a widely discussed topic now. It's starting to come. You even hear them talking about it on financial channels from time to time, MSNBC. But I liked it hearing it most from my friend, the former New York banker, who mm -hmm. worked at a you know big big bank in New York, and he was involved with sovereign wealth funds, and he knows 
he really understands how this works. So as an example, and he's not a Trump fan, he'll say, oh, uh, China tariffs? Uh, Trump's got all the cards. Uh, China's fucked. They may come back and try and, you know, and, and come back for revenge in 20 years, but uh, Trump will win this. Then when it comes to modern monetary theory, the, the whole idea is that the United States uniquely can print as much money as it wants and it will not hurt our economy. And it's counterintuitive to everything that economics says. It's counterintuitive to the Austrian school of economics. It's, count, it's counterintuitive to the Republican Party, um, who are always about, you know, uh, you, you, you got to bring down the deficits. And at the same time, you got to bring down taxes. And I say, well, but how do you know this will really work? He says, well, look at Trump's tax cuts. Printed trillions of dollars for the rich, essentially. Is it what happens? Eh, not much. Here we are. We're just cruising along. So the theory is you could print up as you want to go to Mars. We should be able to print up as much as we want. And it's not so much that it, I mean, I think that what you need to understand is that the Federal Reserve and you know all these monetary people and the uh, the Federal Open Market Board and who decide you know what we're going to do with interest rates because that keeps the economy in check they have no clue they don't know in fact it almost seems like they do know they want to blow things up you got to have bubbles and bubbles you create them and you get war and it's good for you know all boule of all walks of life but they really don't know what the unintended consequences are of any moves and no politician does no human being really does because it always there's always something that doesn't quite work out right and in this case, it appears that contrary to popular belief, printing American dollars and spending them on stuff for Americans has no detriment. I mean, of course, people have fall off the edge all the time. And that's, you know, there's, as you would say, there's a bottom somewhere and that bottom is not going to be pretty. But in general, it has only helped everything. And it's, uh, and I've actually, po I'm seeing him today because I asked him the question over email, he didn't answer. And my question was, could we print a trillion dollars for reparations? And, would, and what would it affect? What difference would it make? And also, what would the effect be of putting a trillion dollars into consumers' hands? You know, it, good, bad, and different? I, I really don't know. But that would be the way to do it. Right. So, so what I'm saying is this that, when she said it's not politically feasible, not from yet. This new yeah. mod- from the new from, from the new thinking, it might be. But isn't that the same thinking they're using for um <laughs> for, for uh, student, uh, green student, new deal? Yeah, student debt, student everything. Loans. Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, this See, now, but now you're at the crux of the problem because the debate about student loans is very similar to the debate about reparations. It's who does it go to? Who gets screwed in the deal? Because there's a cutoff for all kinds of stuff. And uh, then how much is fair? It's all the same discussion. And and honestly, I don't know if any of that's going to happen. I'm not so sure we're going to see uh, student loan debt paid off because it behooves. It, look, slavery, this is slavery. People who go to school have a student loan regardless of your culture, creed, color, background, you are, in, in effect, a slave of the United States to pay that off for a long time. Could be the rest of your life. They, you know, there's ideas of, well, may we, com- we create some kind of public service department where you can work off some of the loan. Sounds like slavery to me. Well, yeah, I mean, what, what really irks me is that you not hear this somebody else say, "Oh, it's not phys- um, politically feasible," when the number's way bigger. Correct. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Oh yeah. Oh, de- <laughs> oh definitely. Oh yeah. There's, there's, that's another aspect. I hadn't even thought about that. E- even this early out, I mean, because we know once you start getting closer to the general election, you had to start reeling some of your promises in. Yeah. You know, and start being become more realistic. But it's just that. I don't know. That's just me personally. When you say, yeah, I know it's this, but now we can only give you 10%. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's disingenuous. Disingenuous is what it is. Right. Well, but, you I know, mean, but you know she what? Did say, I, she did say IDOS, so I got to give her credit. Yeah, well, she, she actually <laughs> says <laughs> American descendants of slavery. I, right. But she's also being coached. She's got Antonio Moore. She talks to him. You sent me that article. So she, So she's got a good a good understanding. I really want to think she's genuine and she's uh, sincere. Uh, you, but you I, never really I think know. She is. I mean, I, honestly, I think my my BS detector doesn't go off with her. But I think she has to leave the door open. You know, it's like she has to couch certain statements with other things like, oh, yeah, it's not politically feasible and things of that nature. So it's like, I don't know. Well, my question is, why don't we hear any of the black candidates talking like this? This is this is my problem. (laughs) Yeah, I I understand. Uh, Well, uh, because they want to win. And they know that that is uh, counterintuitive to the messaging. Cory Booker's already in trouble for not for saying black voters instead of black women. Right, an agenda. Yes, and uh, ultimately it's about control. Uh, th- and l- look at what they'll do. L- look at where it's at. Look at look at what the messaging is towards black Americans. It's not this. So, what does that say about what they think about us? We don't have to promise you anything, but you're still going to show up for us. What, what, just imagine if, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Julian Castro. Uh, Castro. Julian Castro. Mm-hmm. If he came out and said, yeah, you know, I want to give everybody, you no know, uh, amnesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that ain't politically feasible. Yeah. How yeah. would that be received? In fact, he says quite the opposite. He says he says we're going to make it completely legal, and it's all yeah, yeah. I I, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Well, it, it's it's you know it's it, I it's unfair. It's and it's it's unjust. It's unfair, and it it really makes no sense. Uh, and how the conversation? I, I don't know, Mo. The, the, sadly, I think this is uh, where the American psyche is at with who the people who are running the show. The idea that it's not, fe- and maybe it's fear, you know, it's just, for, holy shit, we can't, this is, of all the things we got to do, of all the things we got to do to beat Trump, we can't have the black people changing their vote. So just focus on them, keep them where they are, um, bring in, you know, make sure the women are uh, given, are empowered and activated and then we'll we'll take care of our black brothers and sisters once we're in, once we get the crazy racist out or whatever they're saying, which also is probably not true. So just control. It's uh, the population. Hey, look, every government, every country, every land gets the government it deserves. So it's going to take a lot more than Cory Booker or, or any other black candidate to say, hey, hold on a second. It's going to take a real movement to change that. Okay, say if I go to Dimension B for a minute, mm-hmm. and I'm a super liberal, you know, uh, far left guy, right? And you tell me, and I believe Trump is this and that, he's Hitler and blah, 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 all the things you say, and I believe that's true. And you say, well, we want to beat him, but the only thing we not want to do is give you what you're owed. How am I supposed to? <laughs> yeah. How do I take that? Well, we you, can live with that. We can live with that guy before we give you what you're owed. That's that's how I take it. All right. If if you were to believe the media narrative, and that's why I'm a huge you know saying supporter of black people showing that we're serious and not voting. Because, that's why I stand right. because until you make people understand that you won't scare us into the voting booth um, and you take our demands seriously, you know, you can't just come come to us, you know, with uh, fear. And it's a, it's a form of nudging. I mean, they're, they're not, it's, and, and I keep saying this word, but they're going to try to nudge us with fear into that uh, 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 voting booth. And do you think it's still working like it always has? I say that it, we looked at the numbers last time and what went from 66.6 voter turnout to 59 point something. If it drops down to 50% or 
or even 55%, the Democrats won't win another election. And at one, one, one point I want to bring up is, and this is why they're so pushing hard for uh, Kamala, is the order of the Democratic primaries. What are the first ones? It's, it's through South Carolina. You know, it's the it's the heavily black populated states. South, states. yeah, the South, yep. So whoever gets those, you know what I'm saying, gets off to a good head start, um, they tend to, you know, and you know, people like to pull on uh, cheerful winners. So yeah. whoever, you know what I'm saying, is perceived to be the winner, you know what I'm saying, has that momentum, <laughs> has that, you know, the inertia. So, and this would be my final question for this show. Okay. Um, where are the not rich, but the wealthy black Americans who are really putting their money where their mouth is? You can't tell me they're all boule just because they got money. Where are they at? Let I mean, me see. D- d- well, okay, do okay. they have no stake in you this see, process? You see, okay, a, a good portion of them are that five percent that votes faithfully for Republicans. I mean, because that is, I mean, they don't get all of one hundred percent. So yeah, but you, but you got to find a politician who has a message. You got to chip in. That is going to be a problem because even now, where people that are speaking about, say, if you had an ADOS candidate, what it's going to have to take is to say we're not going to sign up unless we get something, and until that happens, we're not going to vote. Right, so you're that's, saying that's a prerequisite before you can even get to a candidate that uh, we have to stop, and that's what that whole democratic plantation thing. And I don't really like that term, but you have we have to say pull away and say no, we're not going to vote for anybody. Let you see how that turns out for you, and you come back and tell me how it turned out for you, and then and then we'll talk, and then we say to, re- to you're saying to republic because I have no I have no allegiance to either party. And whoever, you know what I'm saying, comes with the tangibles, me personally, that's who I will listen to. Because that's how politics work. You trade your vote for, you know, something in return. Um, so if Republicans want to say, you know what? If we get instead of 5% of the vote, we can get up to 15 or 20%. We'll always win. Yeah. So let's make that gamble. A come with it and that's 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 the um the maturation process that we have to go through as as uh black voters to say you know what stop voting democrat because your grandma voted democrat uh stop voting in general because you're being um shamed into voting because I, I went through this you know you're you know we got beat we're saying beaten water holes so we could vote but if i don't have a choice what's the point of voting and that's and that's the question i always ask if I only can pick from one side and that side knows that, they don't have to promise me anything. So I do have a choice. And my choice is one, um, it's two choices you can have. One, if you live in a blue state and we're talking, I'm not talking about local elections because I think everybody should vote in a local election because you really can make an impact there. But state and federal elections, um, if you live in a blue state, don't vote. They do the numbers. You know they do they do the turnout numbers. I mean it's gonna it's gonna go blue anyway, but they'll look and say, wait, wait, we missed uh, we missed here. Yeah. So and if you- well, oh, let me just interrupt you. So to send a signal to really get some scramble going would actually be to not vote in the primary for the Democratic Party, so that they see the numbers and they can take appropriate action and steer their ship. Correct. And they saw the numbers in the 2016 turnout because, like I said, it dropped 7%. Uh, and that's when they had people thinking, you know, Donald Trump was a complete boogeyman. And he's kind of not lived up to the hype of what they made, uh, the negative hype. Mm-hmm. So I see that number going even lower because it's it's a good number of people that I talk to and say, you know what? Not even that, that it's a political stance, but I'm really not that interested. You know, you're not offering me anything. I mean, just uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but if you feel compelled in close races, um, if you're, you know, if you live in a purple state, if you want to swing that vote the other way to get your message heard, hey, I'm all for it. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I know <laughs> is that in the United States of America, 
the dollar always has power. And I hear young people around me uh, of all backgrounds, ages, creeds, colors, and they say, hey, Elizabeth Warren, she's going to take me out of debt. I'm voting for her. So if anyone wants to harness the power of the black vote, you know where you got to be. It's just, and that's not uh, a racial issue. That's an, that's an American, well, maybe it's just a human issue. People like getting money. Get like, right. that's what we vote for. We all, and, ultimately and, we and vote and for as money. You sh- as you should. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But the question, and, and the question is for black voters, how many, how, how, is that a big enough carrot to get them out? And what I mean by that, it, it not, I mean, get your student loan debt, trust me, is, is a big deal. But how many, what percentage of people of, of, of ADOS, say, for instance, would that impact? Oh, you mean, I mean the, stu- we, the student loan debt? I have no, yes. I have no idea. Yes, are we talking about 30, 40, you know, I don't you know, know. Um, I don't know. something as far as um, being taken seriously. And, and the thing is, I want to make this clear. The reason why I'm so pro reparations is not for the, just the sake of reparations. It's that it's such a big act for you to even think about it means you take me seriously. Right on. So final question, Mo, if she can keep it up, would you vote for Marianne Williamson? (laughs) (laughs) Uh She has some other stuff going on with her, man. I mean, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I know. Right. Everybody's got skeletons and weird shit. That's for sure. That's that's true. Um, That's a good question. And and to be honest, I'm not deflecting. I truly don't know if I would vote for her or not. Uh, one, she would have to come up on her number. She would at least have to say the tree word just for the sake of saying it. it's it's more symbolic. Uh, two, she would have to stop saying programs. Yeah. And three, a person's religious beliefs and politics really don't. You know, I mean, I'm, we haven't had a a. a, a politician or president that really met my religious litmus litmus test so i mean that's not really a big deal for me but uh i think uh, if she could clean up those two things she would have a better chance of having my vote let's say it like that Mm. stop say say the Mm t-word and don't say um don't say programs but on the other hand she is running against donald trump and the economy is doing good and my 401k is doing good and it's more it's it's easier to start a business than ever before. Um, hell, I mean, I just just speaking selfishly. No, I, I, no, what you're but, speaking is is the the language of the dollar, right? And that's why I'm I'm very mature when I come to my vote. Uh, I've seen him uh, uh, allow the business I work for to bring three billion dollars back to start a new project. So okay, <laughs> right. So I, I mean, yeah, she would have. She would have to. I mean, she would have to really be strong on her on her language to get me because I, I don't. I didn't. I don't even have to vote and he'll win. You see what I'm saying? I yeah. don't even have to vote and he'll win. I would have to vote for her. So let's bring it around as we wrap this up. Okay. So the the Democrat Party is not thinking reparations will solidify our relationship with Black Americans. They are thinking. We need to target black women. Yep. And we need to target black women to get, make up that 7%. And, and what, is, what is the nudge with them? What is the message going to be? What are we on the lookout for when, they're, when, when the Democrat Party specifically, but I'm sure Republicans will give it a shot too, are trying to nudge blacks towards voting Democrat and staying Democrat, I should say? Ego. Wow. Stroking their ego. And what I mean by that is you're going to put, like they said, they're, they're um, seeing how they could put more black women into politics. But I mean, these black politicians are still steered by non black money. And, you know, uh, so, and they don't take on black issues. So, what good is that? And you've heard um, that Beyonce, Oprah, and Michelle Obama can replace Jesus, JFK, MLK. We've heard uh, they're the backbone. So, yeah, they're going to stroke their ego. That's wow. the play. 
Wow. And how do That's you, truly, how, how do you stroke uh, a black woman's ego? What's the best way? Tell her, um, just what they said. Um, you're, 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 you're the reason why your race has come so far. Uh huh. Wow. <laughs> and that's a very sick. It's very. It's like cynical, I'm not man. Talk, it's it's I'm that's not, horrible. I, I'm not talking about the run, everyday running the mill, uh, uh, working class black woman. I'm talking about these elite. Yeah. And what they do is they put these symbols up in front, just like with Obama. They put a black, uh, quote unquote black man. We were talking about stand the standpoint of ADOS in front of black people and they, and we it was symbolic for us. Uh it's like, wow, we finally got one in. Mm-hmm. So what they're doing now is targeting, you know, everybody wants somebody like them look to look like them, um, or to act like them or have their beliefs or, you know, in positions of power. Let's let's just be honest. Sure. Uh so it's not something exclusive to black women, but that's the angle. They say if we can get black women into these races. Uh, say for instance, say you're in, um, you're in a small district and they put a black woman, uh, in your district to win and that district, they need to win the presidential election as well. When you go, you're going to pull the lever for all Democrats. Right. (laughs) Right. You're so right. You're so right. Well, (laughs) we're going to be on the lookout for the ego play. I'm pretty sure we'll see some of that dropping by. And uh, what are we going to do on the next episode, Demo? Um, I want to look at uh, one, one guy you brought up, Charlemagne the God, and, uh-huh. the, and the protection, probably, and the protection mechanism of Kamala Harris. All right. That, it's a real, uh, real, um, real event going on. And that'll be on the next episode of Mo Facts with Adam Curry, uh, probably about a week from now. It seems to be our schedule. Hope you enjoyed, everybody, and uh, we'll see you around. Thanks, Mo. It was fun chat. All right, as always, Adam, see you next time. All right.